holy hell. It like changes the rules of cocktail balance or something. It has. My name's Leandro Demon Riva. This is the Educated Bar for Life. My man's a total diva. It's okay though, to each their own. <laughs> Let's get into making the cocktail. Today's video is a bit of a departure. We aren't gonna just be talking about a few great cocktail recipes culled from the amazing talent we have around us. I mean, we do definitely feature those in this video, but for today's video, I wanted to bring you back to a pivotal moment in cocktail history that helped to define where we are today, and hopefully, where we're going. Back in 2009, two bartenders, Kirk Estopinol and Maxim Puzniak, I hope I'm saying that right, set about writing a book called Rogue Cocktails. And at this point, we're nine years out from milk and honey modernizing and popularizing simple cocktails utilizing fresh ingredients. And from their perspective, the industry had begun to stagnate. Most cocktail books were rehashing all the same information or relying on very advanced techniques that most bartenders, and in our case, home bartenders, didn't have the resources to replicate. So they set out to write a book whose aim it was to provide interesting and complex recipes for people who wanted a new experience. Rogue Cocktails is out of print and is unobtainable, but they did publish a follow-up called Beta Cocktails, which is still available. And if you want your own, you can go down to the link in the bio and you can check it out for yourself. So I've only been able to look at little pieces of the book. I haven't been able to get a copy of my own. And from what I've gathered, Rogue Cocktails was forced to change their name by a company called Rogue Spirits. And so they published under a new name. So to get the idea behind Rogue Cocktails across, there's a manifesto written down inside the book outlining the aim of the book, which both books adhere to. And I'm going to paraphrase them now because I think it's important to know. And this is kind of what this video is all about. So. The manifesto, number one, or like precept number one. Is that right, precept? Anyone should be able to follow most of the recipes in the book without having to go to the farmer's market or obtain fancy tools. Number two, there should be limited prep time and should only consist of juicing and setting up your workspace. There won't be any complicated syrups or tinctures to make. Number three, reasonably easy to replicate, meaning you should be able to find most of the stuff in your stores or if you work in a regular bar. Number four, these are challenging recipes and they're not for everyone. And you know what? That's okay. Not every cocktail is for everybody. Number five, the book is an evolution of and a complement to the modern cocktail guide. Number six, all drinks in the guide should taste good no matter how weird or challenging they are. And lastly, Number seven, all recipes draw their roots from 19th century cocktails, so the recipes are going to be basically riffs of classics. They're gonna follow templates that you guys are gonna be familiar with. All right, that was a mouthful. Let's get into these cocktails and see what they're all about. First cocktail that we're doing today is called a DLB, which was created by a New York City bartender named Don Lee. Don Lee is a modern day Renaissance man in the New York City bartending world. He is the head of the CAP program at Tales of the Cocktail, and he's been doing that for 10 years. He makes puppets in his spare time. You know what else he does in his spare time? He figures out how to make a more accurate dasher with a 3D printer. That's the type of stuff that he does. He was also a swing dancer back in high school and he was an IT professional before he became a bartender. But when he became a bartender, he worked at some of the most iconic bars in New York City, such as Death & Company. He helped open uh, Please Don't Tell with Jim Meehan, where he created the Benton's Old Fashioned, that very iconic bacon fat washed old fashioned. He worked at Momofoku, I believe, and he opened and co-owned existing conditions with Dave Arnold. So that's all very prestigious company to be in. I have high hopes for this cocktail. I have not mixed it. Today will be a first mix and we're gonna be testing this out. When you see this recipe, you guys are gonna be like, this is one of those drinks that Marius says, oh, it's just, I mean, it might be good, but it's just a brown drink in a glass. So it's not very fun to look at. This drink is going to be plain. But when you see what goes in it, you're gonna be amazed. Okay, so grab our tin. First thing we're gonna do, well actually, less expensive ingredients first. Let's be professionals, shall we? All right. Half an ounce of lemon juice. Half an ounce of simple syrup. And that's a one-to-one -one simple syrup. One ounce of rum babancourt eight year. Half an ounce of fernet branca. Here's where things get crazy, okay? Half an ounce of Angostura bitters, and then a quarter ounce of orange bitters, and a quarter of an ounce of Peychaud's bitters. Ooh, plop those bitters right in. Uh, why didn't I bring any towels out? I wanna like clean this up a little. All right, lice in our tin. It's 
taste it. Mmm. Smells great. I'm trying to think of it's like, I mean, there's a lot of Angostura right on there, but it's a half an ounce in there. But I also detect like the menthol y flavor of the Fournette as well. I'm just wondering if the rum is going to come through this at all. I almost want to, because I'm not sure that I've actually tasted rum Babincourt just on its own. So I feel like I should just like taste a little bit. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's got kind of bitterness on the back end, a little banana flavor. It's kind of got those grass notes. Interesting. Okay. It's a very. It is a very robust rum. You know, it's got a little bit of heat to it. What's the ABV on this thing? Okay, 86. It does, it has a little bit of heat and it's uh, pretty robust. Okay, let's taste this now. Hey, whoa, that's really nice. Okay, so obviously the bitters dominates this. I'm not really sure that I can taste the rum. Maybe the rum is doing something in there. I'm a very big believer of delicate flavors, changing a cocktail in minute ways to create an experience that you would think that maybe you're not really tasting everything that's in there and then you take it out and you actually are tasting that element. So I, I'm not gonna say that the rum isn't doing anything in there, although it's not very prominent. The most prominent thing that you're gonna taste in this cocktail are the bitters. But what's really nice about it is that it's nicely balanced by the simple syrup and you get that tartness, that balancing tartness and that lemoniness from the lemon, which everyone's gonna be like, lemoniness from the lemon, but I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's like that tart acidity that kind of cuts through the cocktail, it cuts through the bitters, and actually the lemon really highlights those bitters. The most prominent bitters in here is gonna be the Angostura bitters. I am definitely tasting the Fernet. You're getting a menthol undertone from the Fernet. The bitters combined are really underlining that menthol. And then on top of that, not only are you getting the spice from the Angostura, but I'm also tasting the Peychaud's bitters really prominently and the orange. I think I taste it all, which is crazy to say because Bitters are such a concentrated flavor that it's very easy to destroy cocktails with too much. And yet this has all the nuances of a more delicate flavored cocktail, if that makes sense. So there it is, guys. Don Lee's DLP. So the next cocktail up is called the Broken Shoe Shiner. It was created by Stephen Cole, a Chicago area bartender of one of our favorite bars when he created this cocktail, The Violet Hour. Not sure if he's there anymore. This uh, book was from 2011, so odds are against it. The cocktail takes its name from an incident that happened in 1905 in France. There was a field worker named Jean Lamfray who killed his wife and kids in a drunken rage. And this event triggered the prohibition of absinthe in France. So what's really interesting about this incident is that when they went back to look at what Jean Lenfray drank before he committed this horrendous crime, they found that he drank something like four glasses of wine, a whole bunch of cognac, and that there was only two ounces of absinthe in his system. But there was already sort of a moral panic about absinthe. They just wanted to pit it on absinthe so they could just ban it and be done with it. And that's exactly what they did. The reason why it's called a broken shoe shiner is because the incident happened after Jean Lenfray asked his wife to shine his shoes and she refused, maybe in a rude way. And then he just, he went ape shit and killed them all. Pretty crazy. All right, let's actually make the cocktail. Healthy. We got this out, but the first thing we're gonna do is crack this egg into the big tin. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, but one of the main reasons is that this egg has been in my refrigerator right here for weeks, and I don't know if it's good. So we're gonna we're gonna find out. I don't know. Is it still fresh? Okay. Well, didn't go bad. With that aside, we're gonna do one ounce of lemon juice, one ounce of pineapple juice, one ounce of Benedictine, one ounce of Aperol, and one ounce of Pernod. Now, I wanna do a little PSA here before we, we finish this. There are two different Pernos, as you can see. A lot of people don't realize this, but Pernod actually makes an absinthe. So absinthe is no longer illegal and you can buy absinthe. The difference between pastis and absinthe is that pastis is a nice flavored liqueur that has no wormwood in it as opposed to absinthe, which has wormwood in it. The recipe called for one ounce of Pernod. I took that to me that it was the Pastis. 2011 when this book was created, so absinthe was legal, but I'm not sure. I'm not, I just took it to mean Pastis. So that's what we're gonna be using. But if you wanted to add a little more complexity and you have the Pernod absinthe, you can use that as well. One ounce of Pernod. Hold on, I'm just gonna recheck this mix. Pernod, Pernod, Benedictine. Yeah, okay. This is going to be a voluminous cocktail, so I got us a little bit bigger of a cocktail glass. We're gonna put it in a coupe, do our little dry shake here. I like to shake with one big rock because you get better texture and less dilution in your cocktail. That just came out of the freezer, so I'm gonna let it sit for a second because I don't want it to break apart too much in the tin. 
Ah, it kind of broke up anyway. Ah, that's why we double screen. And then last but not least, we've got a little rose water here. You want to be very careful with this because it is powerful, powerful stuff. And we're just going to do four little drops. Let's talk about this cocktail a little ahead of time. First of all, the recipe looks crazy. Secondly, it's kind of in the daisy category, meaning that it doesn't have any simple syrup or sugar in it. That's not true. It does have sugar in it, but the sugar is added from the liqueurs, not from simple syrup or any other sugar source. So I feel like it's gonna be a little bit tarter, but then you also have a little bit of sugar from the pineapple. Although the pineapple is also a little bit tart as well. Um, I feel like it's gonna balance really nicely. Oh, wow, that is lovely. That is like nothing I have ever tasted before. So Benedictine and the pineapple balance out the lemon perfectly. Obviously you have the brightness and the acidity of the lemon in there, which make it really nice and balanced. The pastis is really prominent, but it plays so well with the Benedictine and the lemon and the Aperol is just so nice. It has kind of a drying effect on the palate. It's nice and frothy and you get the rose water really strong from those drops that we put on top. It's really nice is that for people who don't like that black licorice flavor of, of anise, it balances so nicely in here, and it, but, but it continues through. You taste it almost separately from the other ingredients, and then that lingers, but not in like an astringent way. I'm actually not the biggest fan of the anise flavor myself, but in this, it's really nice. It's, it's sort of like olives with me. Like I don't really like olives by themselves, but when it's combined in like a sandwich or something or in a salad that I really like, and it is, you know, kind of, I don't know, contributing to the whole of something, it's really nice. And I kind of feel the same way about pastis. But what added into this cocktail, it's just a really nice little highlight of flavor. It's the most prominent flavor, but in the oddest way. Uh, anyway, this is like a great little brunch drink. Um, I would drink a couple of these. This is really, really good. I really like it. So there it is, guys, the Broken Shoe Shiner. Last cocktail that we're doing today is the Angostura Sour. It was first published by Charles H. Baker in his Gentleman's Companion in 1939. And I told myself that I was not going to do all egg white cocktails. And there are a bunch of different cocktails in this book. And yet the ones that I just felt were the most interesting, the ones that I wanted to try the most had egg whites. So the Angostura Sour, and I don't know this, it's just an educated guess. I think it was the inspiration for the Trinidad Sour, which also has a very large amount of Angostura. This one is just a more simplified version of it. I'm excited to try it. I have never tried it. We start now. First thing we do, big tin, separate our egg white. Ooh, that egg was a little excited. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice into our tin. One ounce of simple syrup. I for momentarily forgot how to use a jigger, if you must know. An ounce and a half here of Angostura bitters. We're gonna have to get more bitters. I think we just killed the bottle pretty much. Marry that in. Ooh, man, this is gonna be crazy. So, dry shake. Ooh, make a constipated face. Oh, uh. Pick out a beautiful glass. Big rock of ice. That just broke apart completely in the tin. Oh well. There's like a piece of, there's like water that built up down here and then froze into like a piece of ice. Chip it off. That's not the way to do that. Would this work? I don't know. Is it sitting weird? It's like a little wobbly wobbly. It's okay. All right, maybe do it with the tool that actually makes sense. I just don't want to like break the glass. Here we go. Oh my God, this is crazy. I gotta say though, I, you know, what's funny is that I did not, and this is actually consistent with the entire idea behind the book but I did not consider at all when I was planning this video what these drinks were gonna look like in the finished product form. I just looked at the recipes and I said, these are the ones that I think are most interesting and I wanna try them. As I have said several times, what are we doing in this, Marius? We are, huh? what are we doing in this video? Making cocktails we've never made. Yes, it's the first time shake. Hey, you were really quick on the draw that time. Uh, yes, we're, this is all, these are all first shake things and so I just wanted to do stuff that I really was interested by. Oh, whoa. Holy hell. It like changes the rules of cocktail balance or something. It has its own balance. Like it has a real balance to it. It's not just one note. And the lime is incredibly prominent. And 
The lime also serves to support the Angostura bitters. The thing about Angostura bitters is that they're super drying on the palate. And one of my problems with the Trinidad Sour is that it's so dry after you taste it. But that ounce of simple syrup, which absolutely balances this cocktail properly, I thought it was gonna be a little overly sweet because there is a measure of sugar, I am sure, in Angostura bitters. It's got really nice texture probably from the simple syrup because it'd be a little thin without it. And then you've got the lime juice, which is a nice undertone, but you taste that freshness of the lime in there. And then you have the Angostura bitters, which is that, you know, very iconic Angostura spicy kind of flavor. It is a transcendent experience in its own way. And um, I think that the writers of this book who set out to write a book that would create a new experience and not just rehash all the same stuff that we've seen in cocktail books through the years have done it with the three cocktails that I've tried today. So go mix yourself up an Angostura sour. Pretty gosh darn fantastic. Love it. There it is, guys. I don't know. Mic drop. I'm gonna leave. Ugh. No, 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 I, I don't know why. Um... <sighs> Half an ounce of Fernet Br I'm missing a word in my vocabulary right now. No, no, the entire, well, the, yeah, the country, um, uh, oh, the entire, pro the prohibition. Sorry, the pro, okay. Great job, Stephen Cole. I don't know, he doesn't need to. Man, I'm not gonna say that. Cut that out.